Our last reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter. Sorry, that's really loud today. I'll be reading verses 11 through 17. It's just the very next thing from what we looked at last week, and I encouraged you to uh, to read it at your leisure if you wanted to uh, after last week, not knowing that I would feel like this is just a great thing to look at for today. This our first uh, of one service uh, for the summer and, uh, and when we are all here together, and uh, it seemed like the right thing to do today. So Joe did the heavy lifting with that long passage from 1 Kings. But there are all kinds of points of comparison. They, there is a meeting at the town gate. There is a widow and her son. The son dies. Uh, amazing things happen. And this is a short version of what Jesus did that reminded the people of what Elijah had done so very long before, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years before, uh, but also led them to believe that Jesus might be even greater than Elijah. The Gospel of Luke from the seventh chapter. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe, or terror, or fear is another way of translating that awe word. They were all filled with awe, and they praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've gotten interested in the last couple of years in um, programs that are long interviews with actors, uh, not the sort of late night show things where they're really only there to promote the new movie or to promote themselves or to remind you that they're still around. But uh, some of these more in-depth ones uh, can last up to an hour. Uh, There is a whole uh, show on a channel that's dedicated to uh, to this sort of thing uh, where you get one-on-one interviews for an hour-long, hour-long conversation. It started back with Inside the Actor Studio, which is only on a couple of times a year, and I almost always miss it, and then I watch reruns. But it's this idea that people are asking actors how it is they do what they do, how it is that they can convince us that what's happening is real, and it's easy uh, to watch and to believe it, and it's a lot harder to be the person doing it. How is it that they can make us believe the story or believe the character? How is it that they can convey to us what's important and what's not? And that's maybe my main point in even bringing this up. What is important in this situation, in this scene, in this dialogue? Some can really deliver a great line and they work to get this one line just right, whether it's a a funny line or a significant one, a profound one. Other really good actors, just with a look, with an expression, can tell you so much about what's going on. The whole story can turn on the expression you see on that actor's face. Now, they have information we don't, right? And that's the whole point of being an actor is to tell the story, convey the story. But I was reminded of that this week when I'm looking at this uh, story from the Gospel of Luke. There are two things that ought to just blow us away, even in the hearing and reading of the story, and they don't. And it's not Luke's fault, uh, so it's not that Luke didn't write the story well. It's that we don't always come at it with the right stuff. Um, So, okay, do you remember a time when you're at a movie? It it helps if you watch movies with lots of people, which we do less and less, I know. But do you remember a time when you're watching a movie and suddenly everyone around you realizes something significant has happened, but you don't know what it was? They just realize something, and they're gasp or you know, people talking amongst themselves, and you realize, oh, say, something, something big just happened, and I didn't get it. What was it? Something important. What was it that I wasn't sure about? What was it that they know and I don't know? And sometimes we just don't know enough about the backstory. Maybe we're watching a, a film from a time period we don't understand or from another country, and we don't get it, and we have to figure things out. This story is from a different time and a different part of the world and a different culture entirely than what we live in. So two huge things about this story, uh, both of which, by the way, go back to uh, the first king story and Elijah and uh, the, the family he was staying with as well. The first thing was, is not necessarily dramatic that we should you know, stop and gasp, but we should all go, oh, right, I see. The person who's being carried out of the town gates is the only son of his mother 
and she was a widow. Now we hear that and we think, oh, this is tragic. Um, Because it's not just only son, it's only child happens to be a son. But a widow who has a son actually has a chance in this world. That's what we don't get. We think it's sad that she's lost her only child and she's a widow herself. It's more than sad. It's more than tragic. That means that this woman, as soon as this funeral is over, is going to have to fend for herself in a time and in a place where she may not be able to make her way in the world any longer. She may follow her son in death very shortly because she has no means by which to support herself. That's why in the Old Testament and the New, the people of God are constantly reminded to take care of the widow and the orphan and the alien, the stranger, the foreigner in your midst because they don't have the support network that they need. Only son of his mother... She was a widow. She is in huge trouble. How is she even going to live? And you think, well, the neighbors will take care of her. They may. They should. Command of God says that they will. But Luke tells us she's a widow so that we would know she's in big trouble now. She's not just lost her son, but she's not sure how she will be able to live, literally, how she will be able to eat, how she will be able to make her way in the world. That's the first thing, really, really important. The only son, and son important because he would have been able eventually to grow up and work and provide for both of them. If she'd had a daughter, it would have been much, much harder for her in that time and in that place for them to make any money, have any means of support. So that's the one thing. And that's just what everybody who heard this story for the first few centuries would go, oh my goodness, this is awful. It's not just awful that a widow has lost her only child. It is awful because it's a double tragedy. How is she going to make her way? How is she going to live? How is she going to survive? That's the, but the thing that should cause people to gasp and we just go, oh, okay, it's part of the story. It's just part of what Jesus did is this funeral procession. And the, picture the scene here. This is kind of crazy. Jesus has just given his sermon on the plane and in Matthew, it's the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, and he has just healed this centurion servant that we looked at last week. But as he's going down the road, there is a large crowd following him. And as they're coming into this little town, a large crowd is coming out. So these two huge groups of people, okay, not huge, but most of the town, and maybe a few thousand people walking with Jesus, certainly several hundred, and these two crowds come together and They're kind of looking at each other. What are we going to do? Well, Jesus and his crowd realize a funeral is about to happen. Again, in this time and in this place, this young man, maybe a boy, um, has died only hours before. They they did not wait long at all before burial. And they are carrying him out. Pallbearers, uh, in a sense, are carrying him out. But it's not a coffin. I read a translation this week that talked about Jesus came up and touched the coffin. It's not a coffin. And if you're not familiar with the beer, B-I-E-R, it's just a plank. And the body is covered, but they're carrying him out on a plank that these men are holding on their shoulders as they walk out to bury him. And they had to gather these people quickly. They probably knew the boy was sick and in trouble. But as soon as he died, they began to make funeral preparations right away. And it happened that day, generally speaking. But that's the thing. So you picture these two crowds coming together, Jesus and his disciples, and all the crowd following him stop out of respect. And here comes this crowd, and the widow is leading the way. A large crowd of the town was with her. And when Jesus saw her, when the Lord saw her, Luke loves to call Jesus the Lord in a way that's not just respect, but significant. He's the Lord. When he saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Her son died a few hours ago and she is without means or support in this world. And Jesus says, don't cry. Two things he says that could have been very, very cruel if it were not the fact that it was Jesus talking who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Do not cry because he knows what he's about to do. Okay, here's the gas point. This is the part that should have just shocked you all. But we're not all good Jews here, so you didn't know. You didn't know to be shocked. He went up and he touched the beer, this plank on which the body is. He went up right up to it and touched it. And the people carrying it stopped dead. And we should all go, oh my God. Goodness, I can't believe he just did that. Why? Well, for lots of reasons. But basically, if you didn't have to, you didn't go anywhere near a dead body. Well, that maybe hasn't changed. But there is a religious, ceremonial, very important reason for that. If you were to touch a dead body, you were ceremonially unclean for seven days. And on the third day, on the seventh day, you had to ceremonially ceremonially wash yourself to purify yourself from the uncleanness of touching the corpse. And that is complicated because if you don't, Okay. In Numbers 19, it says, if you don't go through this process of ritually purifying yourself, then you're unclean forever. 
Well, that sounds unfortunate, but it's horrible because it means you can't... It's not only that you can't go into the tabernacle or the synagogue or the temple and worship. It's also that you can't be around people because it's catching. If I'm unclean and I get close to you and if I touch you, then you're unclean. And then we all have this seven-day period of uncleanness. And what if church comes up? Can't go to church until you're ceremonially clean again. But if you go and touch other people and you can see how this could be a problem, you're walking in the marketplace and what if that person next to me is not clean, religiously speaking? That's pretty shocking. It's, and as a matter of fact, uh, in the way that it talks about in Numbers, remember in Numbers the people are still wandering through the wilderness. So it says, if you enter into the tent of a dead person, you might be thinking, well, I'm not planning to go in any tents if there's a dead body in there, but that was their house at the time. If you entered the house where a dead person was, then you were unclean for seven days. Jesus could easily have avoided this. But amazingly, he not only comes up to this crowd, he reaches out on purpose and touches the plank they're carrying this young boy on. And of course they stop. They can't believe this man has just done this. All the men carrying him know that they're going to be unclean for seven days. All the family, the others are there to support, but they aren't getting anywhere close. And Jesus, on purpose, nobody does that. It's not just inconvenient. It's socially not appropriate. You don't want to be around an unclean, ceremonially, religiously unclean person. And Jesus, who is the source of cleanness, who is the source of purity, who is the one who makes people holy, just goes right up and touches it, and they stop. And then he says something that also would be very cruel if it were not Jesus speaking. Can you imagine? You're about to go and bury this child And a stranger comes up, stops everything, and then speaks to the boy, the young man. It's kind of vague exactly how old this person is. Young man, I say to you, get up. And before people even have time to register their shock or their upset, I can't believe this. Who is this man? Who does he think he is? How cruel it is that he would say so. Before they could even process all these things, what is he thinking? He's touching, and now he's saying, get up, and don't, doesn't he know this is a dead person? Before he can, they can even think through all these things, shock, dismay, upset, anger, indignation, concern for the mother, the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. That's an important phrase. He gave him back to his mother. That's what Elijah did. He carried the boy up to the upper room, cried out to the Lord three times. And when he was awake and alive again, he carried him down and gave him back to his mother. Jesus not only reversed death. I read that phrase several times this week. Reversed death. Brought the dead to life. But he also restored support and care and a future and a hope. For this widowed mother who thought she had lost her only child, who had in fact lost her only child, and now brought back to life. Young man, I say to you, get up. And he sat up and began to talk. How would you respond if you were in this situation? Like I said, I take tiny bit of issue. They were all filled with awe. Well, yeah, they were scared. It's a clear word. The Greek is very clear. It's phobos, where we get our phobia word, right? Phob- they were frightened. They were scared. But they were scared in a good way. John Calvin was nice enough to say this. There are lots of kinds of fear. Uh, There's the fear, oh my goodness, something horrible is going to happen. There's the being afraid of somebody else because of what they might do. Being afraid of a situation because it's unknown to you, uncertain to you. And then there's what Calvin calls a a good kind of fear. And that's why the translation is not bad at all. They were filled with awe and reverence. God just showed up in our midst. And what are we going to do now? They were filled with awe, but they also praised God. Death has been overturned. The one who was dead, who was alive, the woman who was without hope in a future, suddenly has all of that returned to her, given back to her. They're filled with awe. They praise God, and they get it almost right. Everyone's thinking of Elijah at this point. Almost everyone. Elijah, remember, goes essentially in private. We know the story, and Joe read it for us. Uh, But Elijah has to do something, right? Uh, It's sort of a prophetic, ancient, Near Eastern CPR. He lays down on the boy three times, cries out to the Lord, and then the boy is restored to life. His protege, Elisha, is also going to raise somebody from the dead. He is going to send a man with a a servant with a staff and put it over this boy who has died. And then he's going to come, and he's also going to lay himself on the child, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, feet to feet. And it's, again, this sort of uh, Old Testament prophetic CPR. And the boy sneezes seven times and he's alive again, right? 
Jesus doesn't have to do any of that. Jesus is not crying out to God in desperation and anger like Elijah, and that'll really preach. Boy, think about that. Elijah, the prophet of God, is saying, God, how could you do this? There are times that that's an appropriate prayer. How could this happen? How could this happen to this person? How could you do this? And God essentially says, I didn't do it, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to raise this one to life again. Jesus just goes up and says, young man, get up. And he does. Same as last week, the power of the word. When the living word of God is there among the people and he says something should happen, it happens. And the dead was raised and the dead are raised. They're filled with awe and they praise God. And again, they almost write, a great prophet has appeared among us. Almost. Although since then, the church has said, yes, actually, not, not wrong. Jesus is both prophet and priest and king. He's not a great prophet. He is the greatest of all. But this is, I think, the most important phrase of the whole story. The people get this right. God has come to help his people. The direction most people go with this story, of course, is to say, okay, in this world, people get sick and people get hurt and people die. But that is this world and there is a world to come. And the dead are raised to life. And that's absolutely true. For sure and certain, we see it in Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones, but we see it also all throughout the New Testament. We who die, who belong to Christ, will be raised and will be brought back to life again. Absolutely true. But maybe not the point of this story. This young man, this only son of his mother, was dead and is raised to life. He who was on the funeral bier being carried out, essentially in his own coffin, was brought back to life. But where are we in the story? Are we the large crowd, one direction or the other, the disciples' crowd or the village crowd? Are we in the place of the mother? Are we in the place of others? The hard thing to get about this is that it's really foreshadowing not just our resurrection after death, but it is showing us that we who once were dead are now alive. We don't like to think of ourselves this way at all. Some of us don't remember a time when we were separated from Christ, and others of us absolutely remember there was a time when I wanted nothing to do with this God and nothing to do with this Jesus, and now here I am in church on a Sunday morning. Others of us grew up in the faith, and uh, we knew that to belong to Christ was everything, but we didn't remember not belonging that's one of the reasons that I had Joe read that passage from Romans, that we were buried with Christ in a death like his, and we were raised with Christ in a resurrection like his. We are united with Christ. The hard point of the story is that we're the ones being carried out of the town gate until Jesus comes and says, get up. And we who once were lost have been found, and we who once were dead are raised to life. This is a congregation of people who once were dead. Whether we remember it, whether we realize it or not, the Bible says this is absolutely the situation for us, for sure and certain. We once were dead, and now we are alive if we belong to Christ. So that when death does come, we are not those who are without hope, but we are rather those who are looking forward to as the Bible calls it, a better country, looking forward to being in the presence of a living and holy God. What do we do with this? This young man was dead, and Jesus says, get up, and he gets up, and he's returned to his mother. We rejoice, grateful people, thankful people, that we too were without hope and lost, and we have been found. We've been given hope and a future. We have been given life in Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus does. He goes to the dead and says, get up. And we did, and we are now alive, and alive forever and ever. So that death for us isn't really death. Uh, it's just a momentary pause on the way from life in this world to life in the world to come. Eternal life, resurrection life has already happened for us. It's begun here to be completed in the presence of a holy and living God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, I pray that every so often you would overwhelm us with the magnitude of what you have done in Jesus Christ. We all once were dead. And at Jesus' invitation, at his command to get up, we were brought to life. Whether that happened when we were infants or children or when we were adults, whether we were those who were in outright active rebellion and knew it, wanting nothing to do with you, whether we were merely making our own way in the world without thought about you, 
or whether we have been in relationship with you for so long because of family and because of church and because of those who nurtured us in our faith and convinced us of your great love for us in Christ. Regardless, we who once were dead are now alive and alive forever and ever. Through Christ's resurrection, we are people of the resurrection. And we are here to live changed and transformed lives so that the world may know that there is still a Lord and God, a great prophet who is also priest and king of kings and lord of lords, who is saying, get up, who is saying, come, who is saying, come to the feast, come into the family, come into the presence of a living God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.